Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast, inside the business, buzz, and brilliance of Black entrepreneurs. Here is your host, Dr. Francis Richards. What happens in Vegas goes all over the world on Black Entrepreneur Experience, episode number 308. Thank you for joining us as we elevate the Black Entrepreneur Experience by interviewing CEOs, thought leaders, innovative thinkers, and Black entrepreneurs across the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Francis Richards. Known as the credit alchemist, he educates communities about the importance of credit, financial literacy, and leveraging credit to acquire funding to create wealth and do things like live for free or start a business for free. Welcome, Michael Benjamin. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you, Dr. Richards. I have given our audience such a brief bio. I want you to fill in the gaps and share with our audience what you want them to know about you and your business. But I have to tell you, my little ears is perking up like a Doberman pincher, especially (laughs) when you say start a business for free, because you know that is the pulse and do things and live for free because we know how debt Mm. and money challenges can weigh us down. But I'm going to let you take over. All right. Appreciate you having me on the platform. First and foremost, you know, all all blessings, glory to the most high. Hopefully everybody can get blessed with uh, my words today. My name is Michael Benjamin. I'm the CEO of Consumer Ammunition Tactics or CAT, where we leverage credit, no debit. And when I say that, when I'm talking about CAT, I want to first talk about the core values of CAT. So the C stands for consistency, because it's important to be consistent, not only with your credit, but just consistent in all areas of life. I always like to say that credit is life. So when you're consistent in your credit, when you're consistent in going to the gym, when you're consistent in reading these books, when you're consistent in doing these interviews like you're doing, you know, you're going to get to where you're supposed to be. The A stands for ability. I have the ability. You have the ability. The listeners have the ability to be able to do anything that they set their mind to. And that's not limited to credit. Credit is one of those journeys I've seen a lot with my clients. Sometimes they may get deteriorated. They may get just feel like they can't do it. So just understand that you have the ability to do it. And then the T is transparency. So we're transparent with our clients. And I just want everyone to be transparent with their own journey, right? You're not a bad person if you have, quote unquote, bad credit. Your current situation isn't your final destination. So it's just understanding that. And with the whole consumer ammunition tactics, consumer came from the fact that I kind of woke up as far as just being aware of the truth about credit. When I'm talking about the truth about credit, just talking about different consumer credit laws, a lot of people may not know, but the United States is defined as a corporation under 20, it's a code, 28 USC, which is US code 3002. If you go down to number 15, it defines the United States as a corporation. So as I had an awakening coming into studying all of these different laws, such as the FDCPA, which is a Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the FCRA, which is a Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Truth in Lending Act, which is a TILA, 15 USC 1601. I just had to understand that this was information that wasn't really in our community. So I felt I was doing a disservice if I didn't put out the information as far as the consumer laws, but also just leveraging the credit to do, like you said, do things for free, which we're going to get into in the podcast episode, things like manufactured spending, which is where you're basically turning your credit to cash and reaping the rewards of the of reward points without even using your own money. So it's it's these different tactics and tricks that are legal, you know what I'm saying? Because we're not trying to do anything illegal. It's these legal tactics that can really allow us to get to our next level. So that's just a little bit about me. And I'm excited to be here on the podcast. Talk about your journey and your story about credit. Mm-hmm. Why the passion? Why credit? So credit, because credit is... Like I said, credit is life and it rules everything. Our daily necessities when it comes to getting a house, getting an apartment. We're both in an area right now. So, I mean, we most likely have to use our credit to get that approval. Getting a car, you know, credit is credit just rules everything that happens to be around us. And 
I got my first credit card when I was like 20 years old and I didn't really know anything about credit at the time. Luckily, you know, based off of my parents doing what they were supposed to do as far as adding me as an authorized user, you know, I thank them for that. But as far as the truth about credit with these different laws, with understanding the fact that I could use my credit card as a device to make money, I didn't really understand that until recently. So that's really where I got passionate about it. The fact that I'm thinking over here, I have to scramble all of this money just to start a business for free. But I didn't know that I can get multiple uh, vehicles, zero money down and start a Turo fleet. I have multiple cars on Turo, you know, making me money here and there. And technically it was free because I used my good credit to go to the dealership. And I already got a check from a local credit union. That's one thing I would recommend that y'all do. Don't go to the dealership because they're going to run up your credit. You're going to get like 15, 20 inquiries. You want to go to a local credit union, local bank, get the check from them and then take it over to them. I got multiple business auto loan approvals from Bank of America. I also got a loan from Navy Federal. So I just took my approvals. I took it to the dealership. I said, this is a car I want. They had to get the deal. Credit really gives you that leveraging power, right? So the fact I was able to start my Turo fleet for free, because you know, when you first get a car, you don't have to make your first payment until maybe 30 to 45 days later. So listed it on Turo, I was able to make some money before the payment was due, pay the payment, I keep the extra money. So that was technically for free. A different play you could do if you have that good credit, you want to first establish the good personal credit because the personal credit is going to influence the business credit. And business credit is really where we play. That's where where the real sauce is. So with the business credit, a play that you could do to start a business for free, let's say you want to get into Airbnb. Let's say your expenses are like 20,000. Maybe you want to, you know that you want to spend 20,000. Your personal credit is good. Now you're, you've established your business credit. You can go get business credit approvals. You can go get two business credit cards from a bank. One thing that I did, let's talk about practical things that I actually did. So one thing I did, I got two $10,000 business credit cards from Key Bank. I don't know if people know Key Bank, but Key Bank is only in certain states. So if it's in your state, you can go ahead and figure out how you can get in there. But I could take those two key bank business credit cards. I could take the money off of them using the manufacturer spending tactics that we may get into later. I have a course that's going to drop. So if you guys want more information on that, you can tap in with me to get that information. But you could take the $20,000 off the credit cards and understanding that there's 0% interest for six months. So you have six months to make that money back. If you can't make that money back within six months, Airbnb is not the business for you. You know what I'm saying? So just understand that you have many opportunities. 0% for six months is small. Some businesses, some banks, they allow 0% interest for 12 months. So I just encourage everybody to think in the mindset of credit, but everything starts, the foundation is the personal credit. The personal credit has to be right. I don't know if people know the different data points, but One data point is payment history. That's 35% of your score. Second important data point is your utilization rate. So let's do the math. 35% plus 30%. Two thirds of your report is just based off of your payment history and your debt utilization rate. So you really want to make sure that those two data points are on par. People always say that your utilization rate should be average, should be 30%. I always tell my clients you want single digits. So you want less than 10% as far as your utilization rate. Because 30% is average, but if you're listening to this podcast, I know that you're not average. You know, you've seen the get different guests that she's had on here. You know, you know, you should know you're not average. So I would encourage y'all to really understand that. So 35% is payment history, 30% is the utilization rate, 15% is your average age of history. So you want to have years of history. You got to think about it. If you don't have many years of history, banks aren't going to trust you. So you got to think about it as a relationship. So I like to say, there's no number that says you have to have a number of history, but I like to say you want to have at least four years of history if you can. If you don't have that, you can always add a trade line just to get that years of history. But that's the last thing you want to do when you're actually building your credit. 10% is new credit, which means inquiries. There's things called soft inquiries. There's things called hard inquiries. Hard inquiries is what will affect your credit report, but keep in mind it's 10% of your score. Soft inquiries are like a pre-approval. It doesn't technically affect you. 
So just keep that in mind. The last 10% is a credit mix. So you want to have a good mix of credit. When I'm talking about a good mix of credit, I'm talking about the fact that you want to have revolving accounts, right? Revolving accounts are like credit cards. You want to have installment accounts. Installment accounts are like student loans. But just make sure that you guys structure your personal credit right and make sure that you can be able to leverage your business credit. But that's just a little bit of information. Wow, that was a lot of information. And I have like tons of questions. And based on that, thank you for that. You dropped some huge value bombs. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about, I definitely want you to get into manufacturer spending. Okay. I'm going to make a note on that. I'm going to put a pin in that. But you talked about someone's listening and they're like, you know what? I'm going to turn off this podcast, (laughs) Michael, right now, because I am an entrepreneur, but you're talking about my business credit and it's shot. I filed bankruptcy. Help me. If you filed bankruptcy and your business credit is not good, first of all, you got to understand your business is not your personal. So you could always start a new business technically. But like I said, the foundation is the personal credit. So assuming that that bankruptcy gets onto your personal, my company, Consumer Ammunition Tactics, we do offer credit repair services. So we do remove bankruptcies as well. So I'm not telling you to come to me, but I'm saying that people do help remove those bankruptcies. But the main thing I would want you to understand is just just be calm because a lot of people tend to defeat themselves before they have to even defeat themselves. So I would say just just embrace the mindset that your current situation isn't your final destination. You can always fix your credit, right? So just really understand that if they had a bankruptcy, it could get removed. They just have to be patient and do what needs to be done, whether they're doing it themselves. I have a lot of DIY resources or whether they are going through someone to actually do credit repair. So once they fix that, they could start a new LLC. They could buy H Corp if they want the two years of history to maximize their funding. But you could always, you could always get out of it is what I would say. See, they, someone's listening and they said, Michael, you saved the day because I was getting ready to hit <laughs> delete, cancel, not listen anymore. Now, when you were talking about age of history, if someone has frozen their credit, if they frozen their social security, how are they getting that age of history? If you freeze your social security, that basically means that they're not going to be able to pull your report. But once you unfreeze it, your average age of history is based off of like your credit card accounts and things like that. So technically, once you unfreeze it, you still have that years of history. It's just when people freeze their report, it's just a matter of, I don't want these people to pull my report just in case there might be some identity theft. So you're still going to have your age of history. But the thing to understand too, on your personal side, every time you get a new card, you're resetting that average age of history. Because if I get a new card today, obviously the average age is going to go down. So you could do that. You could lock your report, but it's just that whenever you're ready to apply for something, you want to unlock it. So the age of history is still going to be there. Okay. Go into manufacturer spending. What do we don't know that we should know? Okay. What you don't know that you should know is that you should prioritize doing manufacturer spending every week, every day, whatever you can do in your capacity. And like I said, it starts with the foundation, which is having that good personal credit. So whether you have the budget to hire someone for credit repair services, or if you want to do it yourself, I have free resources to help you do it. I have a place called uh, Cat Credit University, which is in the link in my Instagram bio. I guess I'll mention it later. But I say that to say with manufacturer spending, like I said earlier, you're basically turning credit to cash, meaning that you're spending money, but you're not technically spending it. So I think the best way for me to put it is an example. So let me give you guys a very basic example. So there's a retail method that you can do. With a retail method, essentially, let's say you go to a store like Walmart or let's use Walmart. So you go to Walmart, let's say you have a $5,000 credit card and you also have your debit card. If I know I want to take the $5,000 off that credit card, typically people might say like, oh, I have to do a cash advance. That's how I'm going to have to take money off my credit card. But what you could do, you could go to the store and you could do a split payment method where you might say, let me spend uh, $5,100 or something. 
So you would say, I want to split the payment. So the way you'll do it is you'll put $5,000 on a credit card. You can put $100 on your debit. You buy it, you get the receipt, you can leave, you can come back the next day, you give the receipt back, you say that you want to return it. And at that moment, because both cards are on file, you have the ability to refund the entire thing onto your debit card. So now you have 5,100 on your debit card, but obviously you have the 5,000 on your credit card that needs to be paid off. You take the 5,000, pay it off, but you're still reaping the reward points. So let's say you're getting 1% cash back. You just made $50 just for that simple movement. So that's the most basic example of manufacturer spending. It's a legal method, but certain stores, they may not want it to happen. So just keep that in mind. One thing I always like to say about manufacturer spending, you just got to get out there and try it because you don't know certain methods may or may not work. Because I've been doing manufacturer spending, trying different tactics here and there. I've come up with certain methods that are very powerful that I'm going to drop in the course because a lot of things that we see with manufacturer spending is the two main issues I've seen in my situation is either fees or time fees or time. Time meaning it takes a long time. So an example of something taking a long time is like the retail method I just gave you all, the Walmart example, because you got to take time to go buy it. You got to take time to come back home. You got to take time to go and return it. And then it might be three to five days before they return it back in your bank account. Sometimes it might be a day or sooner, but it takes a lot of time and energy. We're business owners. We don't have time to be going (laughs) everywhere left and right. That's one issue with manufacturer spending. So let me give you you guys an example of problem with fees. So the PayPal method, PayPal method is very simple. If you have two business PayPal accounts, this is legal. Like I said, by the way, we're not, we don't do any scams, illegal stuff. I have two different LLCs. You could also do it with one LLC and and your personal account. But if you want to just, I like to keep everything purely business. Let's say I have business A, I have business B. I have both of them as PayPal accounts. If I want to, and that's the same example, let's say I want to take $5,000 off my credit card, or let's use $10,000 in this example. Let's say I have a $10,000 credit card. I want to get $10,000 off my credit card. So what I would do, I would log into my PayPal of business A. I'll invoice business B. So now I'll log into business B. It could be whatever I want it to be. It could be marketing budget. You know, I might need to run Facebook ads or something. So I'll log in with that credit card. I'll pay it. And then it'll go to the business checking account of business A. But the problem with uh, PayPal is that they cost fees and it's 2.9% plus 30 cents for every transaction. So using a $10,000 example, for every $10,000 you do, you're paying almost $300. So it's convenient because you could do it from your couch or wherever you want to be at. But the thing is the fees. So with manufacturer spending, like I said, I've seen fees be a problem. I've seen time be a problem. I've solved this solution with what I'm going to be dropping in my manufactured spending course, a CAT MS secrets course. And I've solved it because I've come up with a method that you can do from your couch that has no fees and it's pretty quickly. So it covers that fees and time aspect. So if you guys want that information, you're going to have to tap in, but that's just a little bit of manufactured spending. I don't know if you have any more questions on it. That's really good. And when you talk about building your credit, Mm -hmm. can you build your business credit before you build your personal credit? Or you must build your personal credit first before you build your business credit? Technically, there's multiple ways to skin a cat. So you could build your business credit beforehand, but I wouldn't recommend that for one main reason being that whenever you're going to go for funding, your personal credit is going to influence your business credit. So one of my highest personal credit card limit I have is 25,000 on one credit card. So because I have that, that's potentially going to influence what I can get on the business side. A lot of times on the business side, you can get twice, three times, four or five times as much funding as you can get on the business side. So just based off of that simple fact, I personally would want to establish the foundation of my personal credit. If my highest personal credit card is only $5,000, it's not going to look good on the business side. And most of these cards or most of these, whenever you're going to get business funding, you got to be a PG or personal guarantor. If you don't know what that means, you're basically backing the business and saying that I'm going to assume liability for it and things like that. 
you obviously have, for those of y'all that know, you obviously have some cards with no PG, like a Divi or something like that. But most of these business credit cards and funding you're going to have to do, you're going to have to require a PG. So that's why I would, I teach to build your personal first as a foundation and then build a business. But technically you could build the business, but you want to, I don't want to say how you should do it, but I prefer people to build the personal 